The scripture reading this morning will be from Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 12. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. In the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see each of you here this morning. We are in the middle of Labor Day weekend. We enjoyed uh, camping this weekend, spending some time with the church family, with our spiritual family. Uh, Before we get into our study this morning, I have a couple of announcements to make. One is we have uh, some new members of the Swartz Creek congregation. Uh, Jamie Farrar and her husband Ron and her daughter Michaela and her husband Matt, if y'all would either stand or raise your hands, or there you are, there they are. Uh, Jamie, thank you. Jamie is Pam Zito's daughter, uh, and so they uh, desired to place membership with the congregation here and met with the elders last Sunday, uh, and so welcome them to uh, the Swartz Creek Church family. Thank you. Uh, they, they are ready to get involved in the work and worship of the church here. Secondly, Every year about this time, I have a special prayer for the young people in our congregation, those who are starting school for the very first time, preschool, all the way up to our college students. Today we're going to do that, but I want us to do it after our worship this morning, Uh, and Mark will come and lead a prayer at that time, but I want to have all of our our young people to, to line up here in front of you so that you can see how many young people we have. Now, obviously some of them are gone uh, because of the holiday, But we hear the young people in our audience, but we might not see all of them. And I think you will be encouraged to see all of our young people from preschool uh, through college, those who are here with us today. And so we're going to have that special prayer after our worship this morning. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention tell us that in the United States, and these numbers are from 2019, that for every 1,000 people in the United States, we have six marriages. They also say that for every 1,000 people in the United States, we have almost three divorces. And what that means is, statistically speaking, for every two marriages, we're going to have one of them end a divorce. And I think part of the a big part of the problems that we experience in our country today is because of the breakdown in marriages. I think the reason why we have so many problems in school, the reason why we have so many problems in society, the reason why we have so many uh, problems with uh, rioting and looting and that kind of thing is a breakdown in marriage. And one result of that, one negative result of that breakdown in marriage is that the next generation has decided that they would rather just live together instead of being married. And one of the sad things about that is, and these statistics come from the Barna Research Group, and Barna is a faith-based research organization, And they ask young people about living together, sleeping together without being married. And you can see there that 65% of Americans say that that's a good idea. And perhaps even worse than that, 41% of people who claim to be Christians say it's a good idea. Now there's a big gap and the age of those who say it's a good idea and those who do not. 72% of those millennials say it's a good idea 
to live together before marriage. And the group that the elders, the, the Barna Research considers elders, and those are people that are 65 and above, only one-third of those say it's a good idea. Now you know that people who do this say, first of all, the reason why they do it is because they want to see if they're compatible. We want to see if we're compatible. Now there's nothing that says commitment like meeting together in front of friends and family and making an oath before the God of heaven that I'm going to give myself, my body, and my heart to you for the rest of my life. There's no way that you can see if you're compatible unless you make that kind of commitment. Everything else is fluff. Some of these young people say, we want to live together to save money on rent. You know what the bottom line is? And this, this isn't true just with Hollywood. This is true across the board that our society is worshiping sex as opposed to God. When somebody says, I will live with somebody and I will engage in this behavior that God says is sinful, then what that fundamentally means is I like sex more than I do God. And I'm going to engage in this behavior even though my God tells me it's wrong. The first Sunday of every month this year, we're talking about God's guide to a well-lived life, walking with Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. You heard Kenny read this morning from Mark chapter 10, where Jesus tells us that if we want to have the well-lived life, we've got to take marriage seriously. Now next year, the first Sunday of every month, I'm going to have a dozen sermons on the art of loving... How can we strengthen our marriage? Well, fundamentally, we have to learn how to love. So next year, 2022, we're going to take Paul's definition of love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're going to have 12 sermons on the art of loving. When I bought my computer earlier this year, I got a six-month free subscription to Apple News. And so every day, every other day or so, I'm scanning through the headlines, and I come across this article from a fashion magazine out of Great Britain. It's called Red. And of course, the title of the article is what caught my eye, Bigger Love. And the author of the article is talking about how it's becoming more and more prevalent to practice non-monogamous relationships. In other words, open relationships. Having more than one lover is what the article was about. The author of the article says that 5% of relationships in Great Britain are open relationships. What I found striking was this survey, and it's five years old, comes from 2016. But 29% of adults in the United States under the age of 30, notice the difference in the age, 29% believe that it's morally acceptable have more than one lover. Only 6% of those who are 65 and over believe that that's morally acceptable. So we're seeing, seeing a tremendous shift in the way Americans look at this intimate aspect of our human relationships. And we're moving farther and farther away from the pattern that God has laid out for us for the home. God created the sexual relationship in the beginning. God created Adam, and he could not recreate by himself. And God created Eve, and she could not recreate by herself. But God created Adam so that he could join together with Eve, and then they could recreate. And God created us as human beings so that we could recreate because God wants heaven filled with human beings. He created us in His image so that we could live with Him in heaven throughout eternity. That was an act of love. But when God brought these two individuals together in the very first marriage ceremony that has ever been performed among human beings, God is the one who performed it. And he tells Adam and Eve when they come together, he says, you need to leave your father and mother and you need to be stuck to 
linked to, glued to each other before you are a separate flesh. But now in the marriage relationship, Jesus, uh, God rather, in Genesis chapter 2 says that the sexual relationship symbolizes the unity of the one flesh that comes through marriage relationship. And so when God created Adam and Eve in the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, He set a precedent for human relationships for all people of all times where God says that you are to give yourself exclusively to the other person. The word fornication refers to all kind of sexual relationships that are not authorized by God. Among that large category of behaviors, adultery is that behavior where one of the individuals or both of them are married to somebody else. Homosexuality, of course, is where you engage in that relationship with somebody the same gender. Bestiality, you engage in this relationship with an animal. All of those behaviors, when God gave Israel the law of Moses were punishable by death. By stoning, God didn't allow Israel to decide how to put them to death. God commanded them to be stoned, and then generally speaking, their bodies were burned. Now, God does not require us to do that now under the New Testament age, but that ought to give us, impress upon our minds just how serious God takes this marriage relationship. If we want to have the, the well-lived life that Jesus came to give us, we've got to take our marriages seriously. Now, under the law of Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 24 God says that, that He is going to allow the Israelites to... If a, if a man finds something unpleasing in his wife, and this is not the sexual relationship because that's punishable by death. If there is something else that he found unpleasing in his wife, he was to write her a certificate of divorce and send her away so that she could get married to somebody else, and the next husband would know that she's not being divorced because of sexual sin. But the bottom line is, God says in Malachi 2 and verse 16, I hate divorce. So we pick up with this text from Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 2. Do you have God's Word opened in front of you? Let's see what happens in this event in the life of Jesus. Verse 2, we've got the question. Some Pharisees come up to Jesus and they were testing him and began to question him whether it is lawful for a man to divorce a wife. President Ronald Reagan, while he was governor of the state of California, is the first governor to sign a bill into law that allowed divorce for any reason. That is, you didn't have to have evidence or proof that your spouse had committed adultery on you. You could divorce her for any reason. And so today we have what is called no-fault divorce. Basically, that's what the Pharisees are asking. Now, notice uh, Mark records that the Pharisees come to Jesus testing Him. That shows us that their motivation was not pure. Their motivation was not sincere. They were not being honest with this question. They're testing Jesus because they want Him to say something that's going to make Him unpopular among the people. And so the Pharisees asked Jesus, basically, can we divorce our spouse for any reason? There were two schools of thought, two areas of thought prevalent among the Jews at that time based on the Jewish rabbi that took that particular position. And the question relates to that passage from Deuteronomy chapter 24. What is the unclean thing that Moses allows divorce? And so Shammai, Rabbi Shammai, took the position that it was only sexual immorality. You could only divorce for sexual immorality. That's Deuteronomy 24. Rabbi Hillel says, no, that uncleanness that Moses talked about could be anything. If your wife burned the biscuits, for example, you could divorce your wife. And so the Pharisees come to Jesus and they want him to take a position. Are you going to side with Rabbi Hillel or are you going to side with Rabbi Shammai? But if you know anything about Jesus, Jesus doesn't side with anybody except God. And so let's look and see what Jesus answers these Pharisees on this occasion. In verse 3, 
Jesus answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? Family, if you come to me and you say, Paul, what is it that's pleasing to God? If, I, if the first words out of my mouth are not, what does the Bible say? Then you need to question my answer. These people come to Jesus and they say, what's the, what's the answer to this question? Can we divorce our spouse for any reason? Jesus says, have you read the Bible? Have you gone back to see what God says? And, and so verse 4, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. That's Deuteronomy chapter 24. So Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, Thank you, I must have pushed the button or something. Because of the hardness of your heart, Jesus says, He wrote to you this commandment. First of all, Jesus answers by saying, God allowed this divorce. Just like God allowed polygamy with King David and Abraham and others. And Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, verse 6, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So you see, God, Jesus goes all the way back to the very beginning. He goes back beyond the law of Moses. He goes back behind Deuteronomy 24, back to the Garden of Eden. And Jesus says, have you not read that in the very beginning, God made them male and female? Family, the United States of America did not create marriage. God did. And so we cannot define marriage. Only God can. And so in our society today to talk about homosexual marriages is like talking about single uh, married bachelors. It's a contradiction in terms. You can't have a marriage in the eyes of God between two gays. Marriage is created by God. And because it's created by God, it's regulated by God. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the, the most extensive discussion we have of the marriage relationship in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul teaches that God, if somebody is authorized to get married in the eyes of God, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, God recognizes that relationship. Why? Because God is the one who created marriage in the first place. That's what Jesus says here in verse 5, verse 6. Jesus says, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Because God is the one that created the marriage relationship, because He's the one that joins a man and a woman together in the marriage relationship, God says, you do not have a right to break up that relationship. There is no governor that has a right to break up a marriage relationship that has been joined together in the eyes of God. There is no president that has the right. There is no group of elders that have a right to break up a marriage relationship that has been joined together by God. Jesus says what God has joined together, man should not break up. Verse 9. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So these are the answers that God has given His apostles here at the very beginning. Moses permitted this divorce, Deuteronomy 24. God's original marriage law applies to all marriages, Adam and Eve. That means that there is no polygamy, which is multiple wives. There is no polyandry, which is multiple husbands. And, of course, there is no homosexuality. Jesus here says that God created the act of marriage. And so I want to emphasize this morning relative to those young people that think that they can sleep together outside of marriage and everything will be okay. That's just a lie. The whole relationship is a lie because if you're engaging in a sexual relationship and you've not yet entered into marriage, then you're living a lie. You're presenting yourself to society, to your family, friends, or whatever that you're married. That you have the right to enjoy the benefits of marriage. But if you have not yet said, I do, that whole relationship is a lie. And for so, so for these, these young people who think, I can decide if I want to be married to this person by living together with them, the whole basis of that is false. It's a lie. Because they're presenting something that's just not true. True. 
And so the third part of this answer that Jesus gives here is that what God joins together, man should not separate. Now, Jesus leaves the Pharisees on this occasion and he goes into his house, verse 10, probably Peter's house, they're in Capernaum. Verse 10, in the house the disciples began questioning him about this again. Because this, you, I don't have to tell you this, you know this is one of the most restrictive and narrow teachings that Jesus is about to give in all of Scripture. If our society is going to reject anything out of the Word of God, they're going to reject His narrow definition of marriage and divorce. Same thing's true with the apostles at this time because they come to Jesus, verse 11, and they ask more about this. And Jesus said to them in verse 11, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And we're going to come back and take that verse apart in just a moment. Verse 12. Now in that society, Jewish men were the only ones who were really allowed the right to begin a divorce proceeding. Women just didn't have that right. But here in this verse, Jesus is going to say, Yes, women are going to have that right. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul's going to say, yes, we can have that right. So in verse 12, Jesus says, and if she herself, the woman, divorces her husband, if she, if she initiates a divorce and marries another man, she is committing adultery. So let's go back and take that apart. Whosoever. It's pretty universal, isn't it? Jesus is talking about anybody. Christian, Jew, unbeliever. Whatever. If anybody, whoever divorces his wife and enters into a second relationship, enters into a second marriage, commits adultery against her. That is, he is violating that vow that he made to her to be faithful to her. He's broken it up. And Jesus says he's committing adultery against her. And so Jesus here defines it very narrowly. And he says that we need to take our marriages seriously. Now, if that was the extent of the teaching of Jesus on marriage and divorce, we would say, well, you could never enter into a second marriage unless you're, uh, you can never enter a second marriage. If, if Mark was all that we had. And you think about that for just a moment. Very early on, Mark's writing his gospel, and his gospel is being spread among churches. And if the church received only Mark's gospel, then he might say, well, there's, there's no way to enter into a second marriage. But there are two texts where Jesus tells us that there's one exception that he will allow to this law. Turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, out of the Sermon on the Mount, and read very simply what... The, 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 the teachings of Jesus are not hard to understand. They're not hard to understand. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32, and then we'll jump over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 5 and verse 31, Jesus says, Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That's what you've heard said. That was Deuteronomy chapter 24. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So in this general rule where Jesus says, do not break up your marriage, God has joined that marriage together, you do not break it up, Jesus says there's one exception to that. And that is if your spouse is guilty of sexual misbehavior against your marriage relationship. Look over to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. Matthew chapter 19 is the same context as Mark chapter 10, so we don't have to go back over that context. But Jesus here again gives that exception. Matthew 19 and verse 9. Jesus said, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality. Now that word translated sexual immorality is the word for fornication. That's the broad general term for all sexual conduct that has not been authorized by God. If you divorce your wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. So Jesus here 
says that we need to take our marriages seriously. And if we're having an issue with our spouse, we need to work it out. But walking away from our marriage is not the answer in the eyes of God. And entering into a second marriage. Unless our spouse has violated the very basic foundation of that relationship, and that is the sexual union. Jesus says if your spouse has committed that, then you are allowed to enter into a second marriage. Now what about those people who divorce, but it's not for sexual immorality? Paul has that text in mind and that problem in mind in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11. We're not going to take the time to go read those verses, but you can write them down and read them this afternoon. In that text, Paul teaches that if you divorce, for some reason other than sexual immorality, you've got to stay unmarried or be reconciled to your spouse. And that's easy enough to understand. Now, because this text is so restrictive and is so narrow... A lot of Bible students have come up with different ways. I'm going to present five ways that they've tried to get around the plain teaching of this text. Maybe you've heard of some of them. I just want to present them briefly and then show how they're false. First of all, some say, well, these, this teaching is only for the Jews. The church hasn't been, even been established yet. Jesus is talking to the Jews, and so this teaching only applies to the Jews. Think about the implications of that. That would mean that nothing that Jesus taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is relevant for us today. That would mean that everything Jesus taught was just for the Jews and they have no application for us today. And of course, that's just not true. That's just not true. Secondly, some people say, well, non-Christians aren't required to obey, not until they become Christians. And you think about that. Is that true? Non-Christians aren't answerable to Jesus Christ. They don't even know the teachings of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they don't have to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. But once they become Christians, then they have to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's the implication of that. You know what that means? That means that they don't have to love their enemy, Matthew 5 and verse 44. All of the teachings of Jesus that he gave, turn the other cheek, all of that, non-Christians don't have to obey that? Is that what they're saying? Jesus told his apostles in Matthew chapter 28 as he was going back into heaven, you recall what he said. He said, you go make disciples of everybody, baptizing them in the Father, name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and, and teach them everything that I've commanded you. So yes, non-Christians have to obey Jesus Christ. They've got to know the teachings of Jesus Christ and they have to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ if they're going to be in heaven. And in fact, if you look at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, and then the very next verse, Matthew 8 and verse 1, we see that there were crowds of people, not just as the disciples, there were crowds of people who were listening to Jesus. And Jesus was teaching them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4 and verse 17. And so what Jesus is doing is he's teaching the crowd of people, here's the ethics that are required in order to go to heaven. These are the ethics that are required of you if you want to be members of the kingdom of God. And so yes, the teachings of Jesus are binding on non-Christians today, just as they are on Christians. The third argument really emphasizes that marriage is a covenant and if you break the covenant through adultery, that breaking of the covenant can be forgiven. And in fact, the person who is guilty and the person who is not guilty are free to remarry. That's that position. That looks at the, the adultery as just a one-time act. You do it one time, you get forgiven of it, and then you can go on. Well, if that were true, then what Jesus said here, this whole discussion here just has no point to it. I can tell a lie and be forgiven of that. I might commit a murder and I can be forgiven of that. But Jesus elevates sexual immorality here in these two texts to a level that murder and lying and all these other sins aren't at. There is something different about the sexual relationship in marriage. Position number four, which is probably more popular 
This is the idea that because baptism washes away sin, Acts 22 and verse 16, then when a non-Christian who might be guilty of sexual immorality, when they become a Christian, then that baptism washes that sin of adultery away and they can stay in that relationship. There are some serious problems with that position. For example, prayer does for a Christian what baptism does for a non-Christian. Right? Baptism washes our sins away, Acts 22, verse 16. When we pray and we ask God to forgive us of our sins, then God washes our sins away again continuously in the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10. So if this position were true, then a Christian could engage in adultery over and over again, just pray and ask God to forgive them, and they can continue practicing that sin. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Another problem with this position is that Baptism does not change the nature of the relationship. If it is an adulterous relationship before baptism, it is an adulterous relationship after baptism. Baptism doesn't change the nature of the relationship. It's still not authorized by God. And then the third problem with this position. Look back at Matthew 19 and verse 9. And I want you to notice that Jesus uses present tense verbs in what he says. Let me read it and emphasize these present tense verbs. Jesus says, whoever divorces his wife, that is, whoever continuously has a, is an inter, a divorced relationship with his wife, except for se- sexual immorality, and marries another person, another woman, commits adultery. Continuously commits adultery. So you see, this adulterous act is not a one-time thing. It puts someone into a relationship that God says is not right, that God says is not authorized. And then the fifth response, and the last thing that we'll talk about this morning in this study, what about the children? I've entered into this relationship. You say, Paul says, that this relationship is not right in the eyes of God, but we've got these children. We've joined together. We've created these children. We have children. We need to stay in this relationship in order to take care of these children. Well, number one, anytime anybody brings a child into the world, male or female, it takes two of them to bring a child into the world, they are responsible for that child. If you bring a child into the world, you're responsible for that child, not just feeding them, but getting that child to heaven. That's an obligation that comes on the shoulders of every single person that brings a child into the world. You do what you can to get that child to heaven. But number two, children don't make the relationship holy. Just because you've had children, you brought children into this relationship that God has said is not right, That doesn't make the relationship right. God still says it's wrong. And so if it is an adulterous relationship, you've got to get out of that relationship. That's what repentance is, is stop practicing something that's sinful. But you've still got to take care of the children because you brought them into this world. And there is a comparable situation to this in the Old Testament. In the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, The Israelites had divorced the wives of their youth and they had married other women. And Ezra and Nehemiah come along and they're trying to get the the nation of Israel to repent of their sins as individuals and as a nation and go back to the law of Moses and do what God commanded them to do. But they had children. But that didn't stop Ezra and Nehemiah from commanding them to get out of those relationships. Go back to your first spouse, the one you should have never divorced in the first place. And what strikes me is that the very last verse of Ezra chapter 10 explicitly says, but some of them had children. It's almost as if God had anticipated people coming along and saying, well, I can stay in an adulterous relationship because I've got children. And that's not true. We've got to take our marriages seriously if we want to have the well-lived life that God designed and created us to have. I realize this lesson is, is directed at the mind. 
The series of lessons we're going to have next year, the art of love, is going to be directed at the heart. Okay, so, so the Bible says that once I enter into a marriage relationship, I can't leave that relationship. Fundamentally, yes, that's what the Bible teaches. And we need to honor God by honoring His limitations that He's placed on the marriage relationship. We need to hold one another accountable. So how do we strengthen our marriages so that it doesn't get to the point where we start talking about walking away from this commitment? That's what the series next year is going to be about. The art of loving. In the Old Testament, God is pictured as being the husband of Israel. Israel is pictured as a nation, as being the bride of God, the wife of God. But Israel was not faithful to God. Israel gave itself, its heart, over to worshiping idols. And God says, you are committing adultery against me. God says, if you want to have a relationship with me, you've got to leave that idolatrous relationship and come be faithful to me. If you are a child of God this morning, if you are a Christian this morning, and you are not dedicated to Jesus Christ, who is sitting on the throne of your heart? Who is the one making the decisions that govern your life? Is it Jesus Christ or is it yourself? If it's yourself, you might very well be be committing spiritual adultery against God. And we encourage you this morning to make that right. To take self back off the throne and put Christ on the throne where he belongs. If we can help you this morning obey Jesus Christ. Become a member of that body which is his church that is pictured in the New Testament as being the bride of Christ. What a wonderful relationship we have with Christ. If you're not in that relationship yet, we can help you do that by obeying Jesus Christ and having your sins washed away through His blood and being married to Christ. If we can help you this morning in any way in your walk with Christ, let us know. Let's stand and sing together.